James chapter 5. James chapter 5. We go from a warning to the wicked rich, to those whose very lives and God is money, to a call for Christians to patiently endure until the end. James chapter 5, and this morning, if the Lord allows, we will go through verses 7 through 11. Before we do that, though, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord God, may that word pierce us every day that we read it. And may your word pierce us today as it is exposited. Father, We ask for understanding. We ask that you help us to be faithful. And Lord, as we consider patience amidst trials, that you help us to stand on the solid ground that is Christ Jesus our Lord. For it is in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. What more can we say than what James has written here? Come now, you rich, weep, howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And the presentation there is that of a courtroom scenario. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Hellfire. That is what awaits those who have decided to make riches here on earth and not eternal riches. You see, our minds must always be geared to the eternal. Abraham was counted as a hero of the faith because he didn't count his citizenship, his earthly riches, but rather had his eye on that eternal, unshakable, immovable city whose foundations are God's. In everything that we do, our minds must constantly be heavenly word. They have to be that way. And it's very awesome, at least the way that I see it, the fact that James starts off in chapter 1 telling us, count it all joy when you're facing various trials, and then proceeds to give us a very lengthy, very hard-hitting list of things that mark the spiritually mature. And by proxy, Show who isn't a Christian. But if we go back to chapter 1, we see that what is happening in tests and in trials and in difficulties is God Himself testing our love for Him. And that these tests, according to chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, produce in us a perfection, a spiritual maturity. There's so many different examples in the scripture, especially as the Apostle Paul writes about exercise, exercising your faith, and how it's like being an Olympic athlete, or how it's like being a fighter, or how it's like being a soldier. The overarching point is there must be exercise for there to be growth. And our faith is exercised in trials. Pastor Aaron was talking to the men's group, the international men's group that we're a part of, because we're men, right? We 
talk about manly things sometimes. And uh, amidst those, one of them was talking about how, oh, well, you know, I'm only able to do 100 or 150 push-ups right now every day. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, since my army days, I don't know if I can get near 50 anymore. But that's not the point. Eventually, Pastor Aaron was talking about bench pressing because the topic came up. And he said, well, I used to be able to bench press X hundreds amount of pounds. And, you know, he didn't get there overnight. He didn't just show up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to bench press 400 pounds and just get under that barbell and push 400 pounds up like it was air. No, that happened over the course of time. Now, each person's starting point is completely different. That's just a reality of it. Now, understand, my arms are shorter. So you would figure that that would mean that I could do more weight, right? There's less area that I have to move when I'm pushing the bar up. No, that's not the case. It was harder for me because of my shorter arms. Well, Pastor Aaron started at about 200-something pounds. I started closer to 185 when I first started weightlifting. Other people start closer to 135. Some people start closer to 90 pounds. Everyone has a different starting point, but one thing that does not change is the reality that more weight, more strain, more stress must be put upon the body in order to grow. You have to add more weight. You have to tear the muscles and give them time to recover in order for your muscles to be able to handle more weight the next time you go and do it. My sister was a cross-country athlete, and she even ended up getting a scholarship at one point to a university in Arkansas or Alabama, one of those southern states that starts with an A, and got to go there for a while. And my sister could run like nobody's business, but she didn't start off being able to do that. And I'll tell you right now, even at my peak, military fitness, where I was running my two miles in 13 minutes and some change, I could not outrun my sister when it came to the long haul. But she had trained her way into that. It's the same when it comes to what's happening in our lives. At this point, I honestly don't know if this was a legitimate saying in the Puritan age, but there are sayings that are attributed to the Puritans. And one of the most weird and controversial ones for modern Americans and modern Christians is the old saying that when Puritans encountered difficulties, death, problems, a fellow Puritan would come up and say, praise the Lord, for he has presented you an opportunity to grow and glorify him. Give thanks to God, because in this is good. And our minds don't always compute that, but it is a very biblical reality. How can we count it all joy? Well, James said later on in chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, that it is those whose love is being tested by God who have their mind set on that eternal prize, the crown of life, on eternity, eternal life, that win. We have to be heavenly minded. We have to. We're just passing through. We are sojourners. We are pilgrims in this life. In the blink of an eye, we're old and wrinkly and gray haired or white haired. The strength we had in our youth fades. But we have eternal hope as our constant. We have a blessed resurrection promised. And that's what we have to cling to. And so while there is condemnation for everyone who fixates themselves on the temporal over against the eternal, we have a call. We have a mission. We have a reminder. We have a command. Grab hold of the eternal. Turn your eyes to the heavenly. And that's what we're reading this morning. Read with me first. Uh, no, sorry, not first. Uh, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it 
until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Four times, be patient, be patient, be patient, be steadfast. I've explained it this way, and I love, I, I love the example. I'm sure somebody else out there has come up with it. But as far as I'm aware, this is mine. <laughs> I borrowed it from the Lord, and then I made it my own. The Lord says, Build your house upon the rock, right? So when the winds come and the waves crash and the rain buffets it, what happens? The house stands, right? That is the image of enduring steadfast faith. But we live in Iowa and we understand what tornadoes can do. The house is standing, but the windows are broken. The house is standing but you're going to need to re-roof. The house is standing, but you might have to put new siding. And that is biblical. We, we have to have a proper view of what biblical patience is. Biblical patience isn't, oh, look at me, nothing phases me. Everything is all right. My car just blew up. And five of my closest and dearest friends just died, but nothing phases me. No, absolutely not. That's fake. That's not Christianity. That's not Christian patience. That's not endurance. That, that's not it at all. But we are called to be patient. Be patient in the midst of trials. That's the context of all this. The trials, the tests, the tribulations. I mean, we ended last week with this. You have lived on earth, verse 5, in luxury and in self-indulgence, you have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. There is condemnation and judgment declared to the wicked rich. And then immediately after, the message to those that are oppressed, to those that are suffering under the foot, under the heel of the wicked rich, be patient, therefore, brothers. And in James, brothers is the same as beloved in 1 John. 1 John, beloved, 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 my loved ones, my loved ones. Well, James wants to make sure we know who he's talking to. My brothers, my brothers, 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 beloved brethren, this is for you. Do you know how many times I hear Christians talk about the serious difficulties they have at work? They treat us like chattel. They give us few breaks. They expect 60, 70 year olds to do starting off the work of 20 and 30 year olds without rest without respite. It's real. It's happening here and now. The wicked rich continue to oppress the righteous poor. Understand my context is wicked, worldly, righteous, poor. Or righteous average. Either way, this message is for the Christian. Be patient and immediately the call to focus on the heavenly Sinclair Ferguson comments James varies his vocabulary for patience as he's done earlier in the letter in 
chapter 1, verses 2 to 3 and verse 12, he uses the word hupomone, which means which conveys the idea of being able to remain under a burden, like an Olympic weightlifter holding above his head a barbell so heavy that it would crush ordinary, untrained men. The same expression is used in 5.11, but in 5.7, be patient translates a different but no less picturesque Greek word, Greek word macrothumeo. Literally, be long-tempered. It is used more frequently in Scripture of God's attitude toward man than that of men's. It conveys the idea of someone who is not easily irritated or diverted. It's something that, and that, that, that's the end of his quote, it's something that James has already talked about. Be slow to anger. Be slow to anger. The mature Christian has a long fuse. And our goal is to have such a long fuse that there is a drastic and massive and serious delay between the time when someone lights that fuse on the other end of the hall than when it reaches a combustion chamber. We are to be long-tempered. We think of the word macro and micro. Macro means large, huge, long. Micro, obviously, small. Micro SD cards. Anyone remember those? Yeah. Micro SD cards were the thing for a while. Not quite so much anymore. But the point is micro SD cards. They were small SD cards, and you could pack a lot of information in this itty-bitty little card. Anyone who's into fitness and training understands what your macros are. The overarching large spectrum of the calories and proteins and fats and carbohydrates that you're going to take in. And you want a certain amount of carbs and a certain amount of proteins and a certain amount of vegetables or grains. Notice at this point, for those people, the, the, the concept of fats and, and sugars are basically nilled. In the Christian life, we are called to be patient, to be long-tempered. Be slow to anger, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Understand, this is a serious command. Just as when the apostle asked Jesus, how often am I supposed to forgive my brother? Seventy times? No. Perpetually was the answer of Jesus. Well... <laughs> How long should your fuse be? How patient should you be? Well, until the coming of the Lord, a perpetual reigning in, dominating, controlling of your frustration and temperament. Be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And then he goes into the agrarian illustration, farming. See how the farmer waits for the precious food of the earth. But he doesn't stop there. He says that the farmer waits for the precious food he likely needs to actually survive, being patient about it. So not only is he planting this, but he is patient in it. The farmer recognizes that worrying about it isn't going to help. They didn't have the irrigation system we do now. They didn't tap into the aquifer so that they could then irrigate their crops at will. No, the farmer in those days planted and then relied on the sovereign actions of of God's providence to bring the rain in its season. And it even goes on to say here, until it receives the early and the latter rains. We have a saying in this side of the hemisphere, in this side of the world, April showers bring May flowers. Uh, and it seems more like the rains are coming in May now than in April, but the point still stands. We have a time of rain for farmers to set their clocks by. A time that God has appointed. And when the farmer plants his crop, 
his very needed for life crop. Because there's no Farmers Bureau ready to give you insurance if the crop fails there. If it fails, you got to scramble to try and figure out how you're going to live. But the farmer in this illustration does so, waiting patiently, being patient about it, understanding God provides the rain in its season and instead focuses on his responsibilities to plant and tend the soil. He knows that once the plant, the crop, has been put in the ground, his job's done. The growth is the Lord's. That this is what we have as an example. Be patient until the day of the Lord. Be patient like a farmer who understands there's nothing you can do about it. The wicked will continue to be wicked. Does that mean that we ignore the other elements of Scripture that tell us to cry out for justice in those cases? No, not at all. But there's a context. There's a way in which to do it. And it's by being long-tempered, in control of your emotions, so that it may glorify and honor God. Our minds are looking forward to the day of the Lord's return, to the coming of the Lord. I think it's rather appropriate as we near Advent season to consider the reality of the second coming of the Lord. Christians must stand on the realities of God as presented in Scripture. In the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulations, in the midst of persecutions, in the midst of problems, how can we count it all joy going to the Word? Asking God, God, give me wisdom. Help me to see that at least I'm not running for my life like David did from Saul. And yet some of the greatest psalms that we have came from his time of persecution. As a matter of fact, Pastor Aaron brought one up during our worship time. This was written during the time when David was hiding from Absalom who wanted to kill him. A hymn worthy of praise to the Lord in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation. How does that happen? patiently waiting on the Lord and knowing who God is, knowing God's attributes. How can we make it through difficulties, through cancer, through problems, through COVID, through the flu, smallpox, chickenpox, polio, arthritis? How do we make it through all of that? Knowing our God. Knowing God's sovereignty, God's immutability, God's love, knowing the attributes of God are great sources of strength in the midst of trials, tribulations, and problems. Mature Christians are those who have grown and strengthened their ability to, quote, be patient, end quote. Or as Sinclair Ferguson said, to be long-tempered, not short-tempered. You know why? Because we're not impatient when things are good. We have all the patience in the world while things are going well for us. We're the saintliest saints we could ever be as long as things are going okay. We tend to think we can handle it all when things are going good. We're like Peter. We really are saying that we would follow Christ even unto death while we're safely tucked away in the upper room under the protection of our Lord. Yet when push came to shove, all it took for Peter's faithful endurance to crumble like sand was an inquiry from a slave girl and some passerbys. That's it. Hey, aren't you one of those people? Aren't you one of his followers? That's all it took. No, you're going to die. We're going to kill you right now. Hey, aren't you one of them? Didn't we see you with them? 
Hey, didn't you chop off my cousin's ear? Pretty sure that was you. That's all I took. We prayed just a bit ago in our prayer request for missionaries, for those that are martyrs, and we prayed for strength for them. I don't know. I, I, I'm learning from Scripture. I don't know. I'm learning from Peter. I don't know if I have the strength of that. I really don't. I have to be honest with myself. And I'm not about to open my gob and say, I can do it. Lord, I'll die. I can endure imprisonment and starvation. I have no earthly idea. All I can say is, Lord, if that ever comes to be my lot, be my strength. Be my all in all. Help me to glorify you in it. But let's face it, sometimes hitting a deer or a flat tire is about as much as we can handle. We have to be patient, long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This fruit doesn't immediately manifest in the life of the believer. The fruit of the Spirit does not immediately manifest in the life of the believer. It is cultivated in the heart of the believer in the midst of tribulation, watered by the tears of hardship and trial. Yet its fruit is Holy Spirit-given sanctification. There's that old saying, I asked the Lord to give me patience, so He gave me problems in which to be patient. I asked the Lord for love, so He put people in my life that had need. We don't know. But Scripture does present us with this reality. Trials will come. In this life, you will have tribulation. That is a surefire from Jesus guarantee for every single Christian. But take heart. Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome the world. We'll have problems. We'll have tribulations. We'll have difficulties. But where's our hope? Jesus. The sovereignty of God is the ground, the solid ground upon which we stand. God's attributes are the bulwark never failing that Martin Luther speaks of. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, a shield, a buckler, a tower of strength for us. The mature Christian understands and glories in God's sovereignty over all things because the mature Christian knows that God works all things according to the counsel of His will. Ephesians 1.11 As the late Dr. Sproul would often say, there is no maverick molecule in God's creation. There is not a single atom in this universe that does not respond, obey, and exist by decree of God. And whom according to Hebrews 1.3 is upheld by the very word of Christ's power. God's reign is supreme. His dominion is sure. And for that reason, we have joy. For that reason, we can endure. It's a solid ground amidst the difficulties and the trials for the mature believer. And that's the goal. That's what James has been all about. Spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. This is what it looks like. This is the fruit of it. This is what it works in you. Remember, James has already called for mature Christians to count it all joy when you're facing various trials because it is actually God testing, testing, testing 
your love. Not for no reason, because we serve a God of purpose who created everything for a purpose. So even the tests and the trials that God is giving to test your love produce spiritual maturity. Going back to that weightlifting analogy, the army is a place of people that are a little twisted. And when you're bench pressing, that twistedness of people is made manifest even more. Hey, five more pounds, and they put 10-pound plates on each side, so you're actually doing 20 more pounds. They'll do it. Like, you can do more. Come on, man. You got this. And they put more weight than you can actually handle. But they're there to spot you. So when you really can't, they'll grab that bar and lift it up. Well, in the spiritual world, we have that same example, but without any twistedness, without any malice, without any evil, God will always give us more than we can handle. But He's always there to pick up the bar. He will never, ever, ever, ever not accomplish what he means through those trials. That's a sure and steady anchor for us. We're called to persevere in the midst of tribulation for patience and waiting on the Lord when it gets tough. And we can do this because we know that God is immutable. He does not change. His steadfast love endures forever. And His perfect wisdom is manifest in His works of providence in all situations. The mature Christian stands on solid, immovable, unchanging love of God because they are God's children by adoption. knowing that all things that God does work to good. In all things, we know that if God did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, we can be sure He will graciously give us all things along with Him. Romans 8, 32. If we know that this is true, if we're standing on the attributes of God, on the sureness that our God is an immovable rock, a sure and steady Savior, we can trust Him. We sing the hymn, don't we? Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Now let's stop and ask the question. Do we consider that a one time and done thing? Or are we asking, Lord, save me, save me, save me, save me. Save me from the problems. Save me from the difficulties. Save me in the midst of these trials. Save me from my flesh. Lord, deliver me from the evil one. We can entrust our faith in the midst of all circumstances into His hands to believe that His ways and His timing are perfect and that we can therefore wait for His plan to unfold safe in the loving grip of our Heavenly Father. All that the Father gives me will come to me, said Jesus. No one can pluck them from my hands. What can separate us from the love we have from God in Christ Jesus, says Paul? Height, depth, power, dominion, nothing. Nothing can ever separate us because we are gripped in His hands. We're held in that loving grip of our Heavenly Father. And the fact of the matter is, anxiety breeds impatience. Trials, tribulations, troubles breeds impatient. Like I said, we're all good and fine and dandy while everything is good. But aren't we impatient? Aren't we short-tempered instead of long-tempered when things get difficult? We're in the middle of trying to solve one problem and another one comes or someone comes to ask, look, 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 give me a moment. I'm trying to fix this right here. Let me get this squared away first and then I can... That's usually our disposition. 
Anxiety breeds impatience. Troubles at work breed impatience. Troubles at home breed impatience. Troubles out in the world, troubles within. All of these things breed impatience, yet faith breeds a resting spirit. It's saying to ourselves sincerely, I am blessed beyond anything that I deserve. I have more grace, more love, more from God than what I deserve. Even in the midst of this trial, even in the midst of this difficulty, even in the midst of God's discipline, I am getting more good and no bad when looked at from a heavenly perspective. Wait upon the Lord. Verses 8 and 9. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. So based upon the biblical truths that we've covered, be patient again. Just that reminder. Be patient. Endure. Be long-suffering. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. You're looking forward to the second coming of Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're pre-tribulationist or not. When the Lord comes, that's it, my friends. The victory's won. That's what we're looking forward to. Be patient. And we were told to look forward to that. And now we're told, be patient because it's coming. The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord is at hand. The second coming is and should be cause for us to be patient, for us to establish our hearts, and for us not to grumble. What is the solid ground upon which we stand? God and His promises. Why can we be patient? Well, <laughs> this is just a fleeting life. We're just passing through. There's better. There's eternal treasure. There's eternal joy. There's a place where there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, and unending joy. And that's what we're hopeful for. That is the strength. That is what helps us to be patient. That is what establishes our hearts. Be still, my beating heart. For Christ, my Lord, is coming. When my heart fails, when my heart convicts me, rightly or wrongly, when my heart breaks, God is greater than my heart. Biblical fact. Go back to 1 John if you want to see it. God is greater than our hearts. Set your heart upon the Lord. Establish it on God's faithfulness, on God's immutability, on God's unchanging promises. And let that be the reason we don't grumble against each other. See, we can put up with each other's issues and with each other's quirks when everything is fine. But on a bad day, that person shook your hand the wrong way. You know what I'm saying? They winked at you the wrong way. Don't you wink at me. Oh, someone's having a bad day. That's how we are. But that's not how we should be. Be patient. Establish your hearts. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. All of this is in light of the reality that the coming of the Lord is at hand. We are to be heavenly minded. The coming of Christ should encourage us to be patient. The coming of Christ should encourage us not to grumble against one another. We can go to 1 Corinthians 11. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love endures all things. What love? Godly love. That fruit of the Spirit, which starts with love. The first of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And it is that love, love for God, love in the promises of God, 
that produces in us a long-suffering nature that can endure all things, be positive in all things. And it's not a fake positivity. It's not. Scripture is full of encouragement for Christians in the light of the second coming. The coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is eminent. It is near. It's upon us. This has been the proclamation of the Christian faith since the Lord ascended into heaven on a cloud. Can we boldly say the coming of the Lord is at hand? The coming of the Lord is nigh 2,000 years later? Absolutely. God exists outside of time. Events will happen on God's time and not our time. When we say it is at hand, we're talking about it being the next great event on God's divine calendar. And what is the expectation that Scripture reveals to us? We best be found working. We best be found faithful. We best be found awake to the things of God. Unwavering faith. Manifesting good works in works of love, in works of patience, in works of encouraging one another to love and good works. Again, St. Clair Ferguson comments, children on a road trip often find that the last few miles of the journey seem to be the slowest and longest of all. They need ongoing reassurance. We're almost there. In order to remain patient. So it is in the Christian journey. We are almost there. In the days when our patience is tested and there are pressures and burdens that threaten our stability, this is the word to remember. And what a day it will be when God completes the tapestry He has been weaving throughout history. Surely it will have been something wait, worth waiting for. When our faith is flagging, when we're finding ourselves struggling, what do we remind ourselves? God's coming. God is coming. My semi, I had to buy a, a, an LLC. My business LLC is Maranatha Transport. And we only have one person who knows the Greek, who knows exactly what I said when I said Maranatha, and that's Pastor Aaron. Outside of myself, because I researched it before I <laughs> had it as the title of my company, and it is Come Lord Jesus. It is a proclamation of the second coming of the Lord. It is a hopefulness. When I had to start my business, truck driving, I had to decide, well, what do I want my business name to say? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. That's what I want. But that's what we're supposed to want in good times and in bad times. We should desire the coming of the Lord. We should think, you know what? It's almost here. He can be here today. And oh, what a glorious day that would be. I mean, can you just imagine that? We're in the middle of praising and worshiping, and we hear the trumpet, and our Lord descends. That's just amazing. I hope that that's how it happens. In my heart of hearts, that is my desire every single day. Lord, come. Lord, come. And that needs to be the encouragement in the middle of difficulties, in the middle of problems. You know what? My Lord is coming. My Lord is coming. My Lord is coming. But what examples do we have? So that we can understand what biblical patience looks like. And that it's not this fake happy, 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 happy all the time thing that the world is trying to present. That's not real Christianity. And the facade of that kind of Christianity crumbles quick. Verses 10 and 11, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. What an amazing verse. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties. Let's take a look at some of the heroes in the faith and what they remain steadfast through. James begins with Job. 
What did Job endure? And bear in mind, again, you've seen the purpose. So there is always purpose behind the trials, behind the tribulations, behind the difficulties that the Lord has happened in our lives. And the prime example of that is Job. What did he endure? He endured the loss of his children, loss of his livestock, of his property, of his familial relationships. You want to talk about some fair weather family. They left him. His wife said, curse God and die. Please just die. Everyone in the town that at one point held him in high esteem wanted nothing to do with him. He was outside scraping off pus-filled blisters that had filled his entire body. His own health was lost. And then there's one little ray of hope. Oh, my friends, my dear, dear friends who have traveled from so far to comfort me. And oh, what a slap in the face when his comforting friends then turn against him and start saying, you're hiding something, Job. You're hiding something. You have to be lying. You have to have sinned somewhere. Even his friends turned against him. So no, patience doesn't mean that there aren't moments when you, like Job, will say, oh God, please just take me home. Take me home. It's a weird concept. But many, many of the godly men that endured serious tribulations at one point or another said, God, just kill me. Take me now. Take me now. Understand. Godly patience, godly perseverance is not somehow a get out of depression free situation. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, suffered from great, great depression. But that depression served its purpose to always draw him close to God. Let's look at another one. Moses. Pharaoh sought to kill him, so he fled to the desert. Aaron and Miriam criticized Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. And then they attacked his leadership because they were jealous of his leadership. So he withstood jealousy. He withstood having to flee. He endured Korah, Datham, and 250 other leaders challenging him for leadership. Him and Aaron. And I mean, let's not forget about one of the greatest shows of patient and faithful endurance. He wandered the desert for 40 years. And then creme de la creme, he failed God and was not going to get to enter the promised land. He endured all that with meekness. But didn't, didn't Moses also say, God, kill me? Didn't he also say, look, if you're going to put all these people on me like they're my babies, take me now. Am I to carry them in my bosom as if I were their mother? Godly patience is one that always turns toward the Lord in the midst of all of it. Ezekiel. Ezekiel was confined to his house and not, e not able to speak until God allowed it. His tongue was stuck to the roof of his mouth. Can you, can you imagine enduring that to the glory of God? You can't talk. Zechariah, in the New Testament, the father of John the Baptist, had to endure the same, in his case, because he doubted. Because being a priest, he should have known of the many times that God had opened up barren wombs, old wombs, Abraham, being the prime example. And he said, well, how am I supposed to have a kid? Or, let's go with this, Ezekiel had to lay on his side for 390 days. Patient endurance? It takes some serious endurance to lay on one side for 390 days and then turn on your right side for 40 days. Let's not forget that God told him to cook his food using human dung. And then we said, Lord, I've never had anything unclean. He said, okay. 
you can use animal dung. Again, why, why are we reading this? Why are we going over this? As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. These are the men who remain steadfast. Continuing with Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told by God, I'm going to kill your wife. You can't cry, you can't mourn, you can't weep. Because the job of the prophets was to live out and do examples to demonstrate the seriousness of what was happening with the people's relationship with God. Isaiah was told to walk naked for three years. And tradition says he was sawn in half. That's in Hebrews 11.37. During Manasseh's reign of terror. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was forbidden to marry. His persecutions became so bad. Again, another man of God who said, I wish I'd never been born. Job said the same thing. Cursed be the day that I was born. Jeremiah was beaten and imprisoned. He was cast into a cistern and left to die in the mud, the muck, the filth. And yet James remind us that in all of these things, God is good to his people. That Romans 8.28 is true. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to God's purpose. We can read the account of Job, of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, of Ezekiel, and see exactly what James said in verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. We can read that and see the purpose of Job's trials and tribulations and difficulties and problems. We can see the difficulties of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah's life and see the purpose of the Lord and that that purpose is compassionate and merciful. But we often lack that when it comes to our own lives. We get tunnel vision. We see the problems in our lives and the difficulties and the depressions and the sorrows of this life. And we think, how can anything good come out of this? How is this the Lord's compassion? How is this the Lord's mercy? We have a sure and steady anchor in Christ Jesus. We have hope in Him. And we have the promise of the unchanging God that everything, everything, that goes on in our lives will work together for good. We will either see it this side of heaven or Christ's second coming. Either we will be able to be old enough to see, wow, God, you worked, you worked incredibly through these difficult times. Or when our Lord comes, his glorious purpose, His mercy and compassion in those actions will be made evident behind every event, behind every trial, behind every difficulty, behind every test, not just the purpose, but we will see, truly see, the compassion and mercy of God in it all. So what do we do in the meantime? While well, we can't see. While well, we can't see God's compassion, God's mercy for us in the midst of the problems. Be patient. That's not a patience that doesn't every now and then say, Lord, I don't understand why this is happening. I don't know, but you do. So help me to stand on that. Help me to go through it here. Oh God, are there some days that I wish I was home? And I'm selfish like that. It's a weird thing. Several years back, I had asked Brother Aaron, Pastor Aaron, Hey, 
do you know of anyone that's ever fasted to die? And he said, no, that's just weird. And I told him, yeah, I guess I am weird. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, man, for about six months after I came back from Iraq, with weeping, with fasting, and with much prayer, I just kept asking, God, take me home. Take me home. My mind is broken. It's shattered in ways that I can't comprehend. I'm going sorrow after sorrow. I don't get it. I just want to be home. I want to be in the place where there is no sorrow, where there is no tears, where there is joy. Little did I know <laughs> that years after that, well, let's get even closer to that. Months after those six months of praying for the Lord to kill me, I come up to visit family and friends up in Iowa and get to congregate in First Baptist Church of Osceola with some of the same people that the Lord has had me shepherd. That I would meet my wife to be in that same visit. It's real, friends. But what we have to stand on is what the Word of God says. If there's something I could have told 2010 me, it's this. Be patient. The weeping, the sorrow, the depression, the tears are for a moment. But joy is eternal. God knows. Even when we don't. There is purpose, there is mercy, there is meaning. And so we close with the words of the author of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good, everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.